Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra. And before we start, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, in today's part 5, we will talk about the general vector space Rn. Please recall, we've already discussed the plane, which is R2. Then, the ordinary space would be R3. So you see, we could continue this picture and immediately talk about the n-dimensional space. And this one will be given by the set r to the power n. And this number n can be any natural number. More concretely, this set rn is just given by the Cartesian product of r with itself. Namely, we have the set n times in the Cartesian product. Of course, for any natural number n, this is not hard to define at all. So you should know, elements of this set are just tuples with n entries. However, as before, in linear algebra we want to write them in a column form. This means that such a vector v here is written vertically. And then the components here are just called v1, v2 and so on, until we reach vn. And as always, these entries here are just real numbers. Now, as we have learned in the case R2, we have two fundamental operations for such vectors here. The first one is the vector addition, and the second one is the scalar multiplication. And both can be naturally defined. Okay, let's start with the addition, which should act between two vectors u and v. Therefore, let's write them in column form and let's use what we have learned in R2. There we have seen that the addition of the components was a useful operation. Hence, the definition of the addition is the same, just with more entries. So we have u1 plus v1, u2 plus v2 and so on, until we reach un plus vn. So this is the resulting vector in Rn, given by the vector addition. Okay, then in the same way, we can define the scalar multiplication. There, we just multiply a real number, a scalar, we call lambda, with a vector u. And as before, the only meaningful definition would be to multiply each component separately. Therefore, this is our resulting vector with n components again. Okay, and now you should remember the set Rn together with these two operations here is called a vector space. So we could write it like this and it means we can calculate with vectors in Rn as we have done it in R2. However, now we've reached a point where we should specify what this actually means. In other words, what are the calculation rules we want here? Indeed, now we will talk about the eight defining properties of a vector space. The first four just describe that Rn together with the addition is an abelian group. This means we have a group that is also commutative. Now, if you don't know what this means, it will be helpful when we list all the four properties here. Here, number one tells us that the addition is associative. More concretely, this means when we have three vectors and two additions involved, we can set the parentheses as we want. So we don't change the overall order of the vectors u, v, w, but we change which addition is first solved. And now if this is the same, no matter which vectors we choose, we say the addition is associative. Okay, then the next property is that we have an identity element. More precisely, this means we have a vector 0 which does not change the vector v. And of course, this 0 here is just a 0 vector that has zeros in all components. Hence, this 0 vector is our neutral element with respect to the addition, which means it does not change the vector at all. And this is something we need in a so-called group. Moreover, what we also need are so-called inverse elements. For vector v, this will be the element minus v. And the property here is if we add them, we get the neutral element, the zero vector. And of course, minus v is just defined by using the vector v with the components and putting a minus sign in front of each component. And now if we have inverse elements for all vectors v, in summary here we have a group. 
However, we also want to add the term abelian, which means commutativity. Indeed, this now tells us that the order for the addition does not matter. So if v plus w is the same as w plus v, we say that the addition is commutative. Okay, and there you see, there we have our first part of a vector space. And then the second part should be given by the scalar multiplication. Here I want to summarize two properties by saying that the scalar multiplication is compatible. Here, please recall, the scalar multiplication is a little bit special because it's a map from R times Rn into Rn again. So it's different from the addition that gets two vectors as an input. Here we don't have this symmetry. However, please don't forget, here we defined a new map we call a multiplication, but we also have a multiplication in the scalars. Hence, multiplying two scalars, lambda and mu, is not a problem for us. We simply get a new scalar here. And this new scalar we can use as a scaling factor for vector v. However, this should be the same when we first scale the vector v with the scalar mu and then scale it again by the factor lambda. And exactly this is what we want when we say that the scalar multiplication is compatible with the multiplication in R itself. Okay, then the next compatible rule I want is that when I scale with 1, we don't change anything. So 1 times v is v again. Of course, these two rules we immediately see for our scalar multiplication in Rn. And with this, only two properties are missing. Indeed, they can be summarized as distributive laws. Hence, this means now we connect the scalar multiplication with the addition. So property 7 says lambda times v plus w is the same as lambda times v plus lambda times w. So in summary, first scaling then adding is the same as first adding and then scaling. And the same holds when we do it with the scalar factors. So when we first add our scalars lambda and mu in R and use the resulting scalar for scaling a vector v, then this is the same as adding two scaled vectors v. More concretely, it's equal to lambda times v plus mu times v. So you see, this is how distributivity works. Okay, in summary you see, these are the eight properties Rn as a vector space satisfies. And indeed, these properties will help us to define abstract vector spaces later. So this should not surprise you, in the end a vector space should be something that satisfies all these eight rules. However, now before we close this video, I want to tell you about some special vectors we have in our vector space Rn. These are the so-called canonical unit vectors and denoted with E. More precisely, E1 should be the vector that has 1 in the first component and otherwise just zeros. Then of course, E2 should be the vector that has 1 at the second position. And then you see, we can define exactly n of them. Hence the last one should be called En. And it has zeros everywhere except for the nth position where we find 1. Ok, now you might ask, why do we need these special vectors anyway? And indeed, I can immediately give you one application because we can write every vector v as a linear combination of these vectors. For this, we just take our vector v with components v1, v2 and so on. And then we can use these components as scalars in the linear combination. So we have the sum vj times ej. And here please don't forget, vj is a scalar and ej is a vector in Rn. Hence, this is a linear combination with the resulting vector v. Ok, so now we should know the vector space Rn and the 8 defining properties of a vector space. And then in the next video we will continue with so-called subspaces. Therefore, I really hope that I see you in the next video about linear algebra. 
Have a nice day and bye.